Over this weekend, members of the DNC will be convening to determine who the next DNC chair will be. Now, with that being said, prior to this event, CNN hosted a Democratic leadership debate. And during this debate, I felt really conflicted, which is basically how I felt with the last debate, because there were times where I cheered on all of the candidates and I felt as though on most questions, their answers were sufficient. But there were a lot of times where I felt disappointed in the candidates as well. But I mean, just generally speaking, I thought that all of them were great when it comes to the issue of voter ID laws, sanctuary cities, standing up for transgender rights and combating the harmful agenda of Trump. And I like how they discussed how redistricting in 2020 needs to be a priority. This is absolutely true. So I agree with all of these things. But just generally speaking, there were times that I was really discouraged during the debate for a number of reasons. There was a portion of it that was dedicated to this notion of a progressive purity test and whether or not the next DNC chair would support primary challengers to incumbent Democrats who are too corporatist, who side with Donald Trump on too many issues like Joe Manchin, Claire McCaskill. Uh, and the first person who got this question was Tom Perez. And of course, he used his typical wishy-washy platitude response. Ten Senate Democrats are running for re-election in red states, states that, uh, that, that Donald Trump won. One of them is Claire McCaskill. She voted to confirm a handful of President Trump's nominees. And she says she's worried that she might have a primary challenge because critics, in her words, don't think she's pure. Is this notion of a purity test healthy for the Democratic Party? Well, I was in St. Louis last night. And I'll tell you, Claire McCaskill I, has a, an immense amount of, of support there. And the way we're going to take back the Senate, the way we're going to take back the House, the way we're going to take back state houses is to get back to basics. That's what we need to do as a party. We have to make house calls. We have to have a 12 month a year organizing presence. Now, since he completely dodged the question that time, she asked him the question again, and he very tepidly endorsed the notion that he would remain neutral as the next DNC chair. If you're the DNC chair and there are challenges from the left to incumbent Democrats, will you support that? Will you cheer them on? Or well, do you think I mean, that's the, a mistake? I think the role of the DNC chair is to let the process run its course. And then we move forward, you know, when the uh, general election moves, uh, moves ahead. So, I mean, as long as the next DNC chair is pledging to remain neutral, I'm fine with that. I have no qualms with that. It's literally in the DNC charter. That's why we were against Debbie Wasserman Schultz, because she violated the DNC's own charter, specifically Article 5, Section 4. Look it up. The DNC chair has to remain neutral. And the job of the DNC chair, they're supposed to facilitate a competition between an incumbent Democrat and a primary challenger. That's fair. They're supposed to facilitate fair and balanced elections. They're not supposed to take a position. They're just supposed to be neutral. But I mean, with Tom Perez, his response, it, it didn't really assure me that he would be neutral, although he did indicate, to be fair to him, that he would remain neutral. Now, if you're going to be neutral, just come out and say it unequivocally. Yes, I will be neutral. We're not asking you to rig the next primary or primaries across the country uh, in favor of progressives. We just want neutrality. We want a fair race between candidates. Now, Keith Ellison came out and did unequivocally state that he would remain neutral because, of course, it's not really the job of the DNC chair to comment on races when it comes to the Senate and House of Representatives and presidential races, certainly. So he just said, look, I will be neutral, but he then pulled a Tom Perez and pivoted to Donald Trump. The role of the DNC is to be neutral and fair to all primary cont contestants. I will call... <laughs> I will make a personal call and say, let's not kill each other off, guys, you know? but I will not publicly shame any Democrat in a primary. It's going to be neutral and fair if I'm the chair. But let me just say this. Donald Trump, as deceptive as he was, did say he was for jobs, trade, infrastructure, and protecting Social Security. That's our message. We all know Donald Trump is a bad guy, but as DNC chair, I don't want you to focus exclusively on Donald Trump. You need to get the message out there. You need to reform the Democratic Party because the reason why Trump and the Republicans are in power is because Democrats don't have a message to send to working class voters. You lost. So you have to be introspective and look within and determine what the DNC has been doing wrong for so many years if you ever want to defeat Donald Trump and the Republicans. So sure, focus on Donald Trump, but you need to coordinate outreach to the grassroots and whatnot. Now, thankfully, most candidates have indicated that they're going to do that. But overall, I 
thought that the response on this question from Tom Perez and Keith Ellison was inadequate. Now, if you thought that these two responses were lackluster, you're going to be ecstatic about them and think that they were perfect once you hear what Jamie Harrison had to say in response to this question. So if Democrats want to be a, in a permanent minority, let's spend all of our time and energy fighting each other. But if we want to actually fight back against Donald Trump, let's spend our energy going after Ted Cruz. Let's spend our energy going after the Republicans that are up. We don't have the time, the energy, and all of the people that we are fighting for each and every day don't have the time for these purity tests. So clearly he was not too keen on the idea of progressives primarying incumbent Democrats. And this was a really startling answer to me because he's communicating to me that he thinks that primary challengers are divisive. And this is what we saw during the primaries when Bernie Sanders dared to challenge Hillary Clinton, who everyone had basically already anointed as the uh, Democratic Party's nominee. Primaries are not divisive. They give voters a chance to choose the best Democrat to go up against the Republican. So, I mean, if you really want to make sure that Republicans don't win back any more states, then you need to have fair primaries so that way the best candidate will win. The reason why Democrats are in minority status to begin with is because they're too corporatist and because they weren't challenged. Jamie Harrison is really telling me that he's going to do the same thing and he's going to try to tip the scales in favor of incumbent Democrats. That's not your job as DNC chair. You're supposed to remain neutral and make sure the competition is fair. So this was really scary, but thankfully we just learned that Jamie dropped out of the race and surprise, surprise, he endorsed Tom Perez, the establishment's pick. And good riddance, because we don't need to have another DNC chair that refuses to be neutral. All you're supposed to do is be fair. And you know what? Debbie Wasserman Schultz wasn't fair, and if we get another DNC chair that chooses not to be fair to progressives, the party is going to be even more damaged. Their credibility will be even more damaged than it already is. Now, moving on to the next portion of the debate, they talked about whether or not the primary between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton was rigged and whether or not Debbie Wasserman Schultz tipped the scales in favor of Hillary Clinton. Now, Tom Perez got this question first because he recently flip-flopped and said, you know, I think that Bernie Sanders supporters, we heard them loud and, cl uh, loud and clear, they claimed that the primary was rigged, and it was. And then just hours later, he flip-flopped and said that Hillary Clinton won fair and square. Here was his response when he was questioned about this. Which is it? Well, you know, here's, here, here are the facts. Hillary Clinton won the Democratic primary. Hillary Clinton also won the uh, popular vote. At the same time, because of the absence of transparency in the Democratic primary, there was a crisis of trust that ensued. And that's why the leader of the DNC needs right. to make sure that we and are investing in so, Hold on a second, Secretary, across Secretary, 10 seconds. Trust. Was it rigged or not? Again, the process, uh, because of the absence of transparency, it created that crisis of relevance and it created the distrust so that was a terrible answer. Thankfully, Sam Ronan swooped in and just killed this question like I expected him to do. But towards the end of the next segment that I'm going to play for you, Pete Buttigieg decided to chime in and he really thought that he was saying something profound. But what he was saying was a cop out. Not only was the primary rigged, it was also rigged all across the country because the DNC has never allowed outsiders or brand new people to rise through the ranks. And it has always been an insider game. And it has been that way for a very, very long time. That is where that lack of trust has come into play, because not only was Bernie Sanders snubbed, not only did it look like Hillary Clinton had bought or muscled her way into it, then those supporters were denied a chance to speak at the convention, and that was the final straw. If people don't have a voice, an equitable voice, like I alluded to earlier, then people are not going to trust the system, and they are going to go out of their way to break it. Secretary Perez, is Mr. Ronan wrong? Well, again, you know, we need every single day as the leader of the Labor Department, the leader of the Civil Rights Division, and I hope to be the leader of the Democratic Party. We have to do everything in a transparent fashion. And when you do that, you earn trust. Trust isn't something you're given. I would it's like something to say you're that. This I think that's a long way of saying the Democratic no. Party. Well, why, Mr. Mayor, why? This is why I got motivated to get into this. We can't allow this to devolve into factional struggle. Of course there were problems with 2016. Nobody could say that there weren't. But I didn't love living through the 2016 primary the first time. I don't know we as a party, why we as a party would want to live through it a second time. We have got to look forward. 
Not bad. I absolutely hated that answer from Butt Geek. I thought it was a complete cop out, and he's choosing once again that he would rather bury his head in the sand rather than actually face the problems and the mistakes that the Democratic Party has made. We're never going to move forward unless the Democratic Party can be introspective and reflect at what they did wrong in 2016. Because if you don't acknowledge that you made mistakes, then you're never going to learn from those mistakes. And furthermore, how can you talk about the DNC cultivating trust when they're refusing to acknowledge that there's a problem that we all see? You're basically telling us that we're all delusional. But yet, time and again, but gig indicates to us that he wants to ignore the issue. You know, he says, why would we want to talk about the 2016 primary? I want to move on from that. Well, I'm not going to move on with that with you, with the party, if you're going to do the same thing to me again. And I don't have assurance from the DNC that they are not going to rig the primary and, you know, House and Senate races against progressives. So unless you do something to rebuild that trust that you lost, I'm not coming back to the party. I registered as an independent specifically because of what Debbie Wasserman Schultz and the DNC did to Bernie Sanders. You're not doing anything to win me back. Now, thankfully, Sally Boynton Brown had a surprisingly good response to Pete Buttigieg. There are more independents than there are registered party people, and those independents want a place to play in the primary system. And so you have a system that's been in place as... Sam said, that's no longer serving the people in our country. I talk a lot about new power. If you haven't heard me, you can go to thisisnewpower.com. And this is what the people in our country are demanding our systems go towards. Something that's collaborative, something that's truly inclusive, and something that's transparent. And it's an issue that has to be dealt with. We cannot just throw it under the rug and right. say we've got to move forward in the but future. We've got to fix it. Now, overall, I expected almost all of the candidates, to have a terrible response to this question, with the exception of Sam Ronan. However, I think that Keith Ellison probably had the worst response, and this isn't objectively speaking, this is just because I really expected more from Keith Ellison, given that he endorsed Bernie Sanders, and the same tactics that the DNC and establishment insiders used to smear Bernie Sanders, well, they've used it against Keith Ellison in this race. At the same debate, he was asked whether or not he was an anti-Semite. So, this is the same thing that Bernie Sanders had to go through. He was asked whether or not he was sexist and whether or not he was belittling Hillary Clinton uh, because he had misogynistic tendencies. And yet, this is what Keith Ellison had the audacity to say. How do you move forward if you don't own the past? Well, D Donna Brazile went to the Bernie supporters and she did issue an apology. That happened. Now we have a unity commission, which is going to be appointed by somebody in this group. And I think we absolutely have to make sure that in the future, every person who wants to vote for a Democrat must feel that it was fair, open, and accessible, and transparent. That is a mission, but I'm telling you, the real problem is ahead of us. People are organizing in the street right now. I believe I'm the unity candidate in this race because I supported both Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. And I believe I could pull the people together so that we can come together as a party and we can win elections so that we don't ever have to go through this thing anymore. Donald Trump is wreaking havoc on the American people, and the Democratic Party has to be the agent of the American people, not an agent unto itself. And so I believe we have to move this thing forward and not engage in the ruinous who shot John. We got to come together, people, and fight the real enemy. That's the real deal. I was repulsed by that response from Keith Ellison. I thought that, of all people, Keith Ellison is the one who should speak out against the rigged primary, but I know that he's trying to walk a fine line and pander to the establishment and the progressive wing of the party. And look, I still support Keith Ellison to a degree, although Sam Ronan is my first choice. But, I mean, come on, Keith. You, you're running away from facts because you don't want to make waves throughout the party. And look, he says that Donna Brazil apologized. Well, if she apologized, I didn't get the memo. Did you get the memo? I think most progressives don't know that Donna Brazil apologized. We're never going to move forward, Keith, unless progressives can trust the DNC again. And if you run away from what they did, and if you run away from the mistakes that they made, you're never going to get that trust back. So tread carefully here. Because if you try to tell progressives that we're just crazy and we're imagining this bias against Bernie Sanders, you're never going to win us back. Now, Jamie Harrison also decided to chime in on this discussion, and he really tried to boil this debate of the rigged primary down to semantics, and what he did was really sleazy. For a, a, a number of folks, they do believe uh, they use the terminology of rigged. Now, one of the things, I, I'm a lawyer, what is the definition of rigged? Are we saying that voting machines were rigged for Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders. Sam, is that what you're saying? 
Absolutely not. What I'm saying is the system in of itself well, is right. in, exclusive to just the people in charge. No, That's but, the but, problem. But when we say, an, we election, right. when we say of, when we say an election is rigged, in the minds of folks, people are stealing somebody's vote and giving it to somebody else. Language is very, very important in this. We're talking about the rules that were crafted at the behest of Hillary Clinton in coordination with Hillary Clinton to favor her, to tip the scales in favor of her against all of her primary challengers. We all did not want Debbie Wasserman Schultz to oversee the primary because she was Hillary Clinton's campaign co-chair in 2008. So obviously, she favors Hillary Clinton. There's a massive conflict of interest. And then we start hearing stories from time that she's colluding with Hillary Clinton to create rules like the exclusivity clause and limit debates. So that way, Hillary Clinton can maintain her huge lead and none of her primary opponents would ever have a chance and she created this exclusivity clause so that way if candidates didn't like the debate schedule uh, they couldn't go to CNN and petition them for a debate if the DNC did not sanction a debate they were banned from future DNC sanctioned debates it was ridiculous so you can't look us in the face and seriously tell us that the primary wasn't rigged I think we're past this discussion the primary was rigged the rules favored Hillary Clinton disproportionately and if you disagree with that if you disagree with the emails that revealed how Debbie Wasserman Schultz tried to sabotage Bernie Sanders campaign she tried to undermine him at every step of the way you're being disingenuous and you're a liar now Sam Ronan responded to Jamie Harris and then uh, this whole discussion got even worse when Jemu Green chimed in and her response almost made my head explode I'm not joking it's the superdelegate system it's the closed primaries it's people not knowing how the system works go to democrats.org and try and find out who the chairman are find out who your county chairs are the system in of itself is not transparent. I've been saying that since day one. Second. Hold on, Jim Green. I want to bring you in on this issue of superdelegates. Uh, do you think their time has passed? Is there a better way? And if so, what? First, every Democrat and most Americans, because we did win the popular vote, know which election was rigged. Period. <laughs> to the superdelegate issue. We do have Hold this on, transformative what is that, what moment. What does that mean? What does that mean that the election was rigged? Are you saying if that the president was did not win the election? one vote that was influenced by Russian meddling that was cheerleaded on by this man in the White House, then that election was influenced by a foreign government. That was soul crushing to watch. Because think about what she's saying and how stupid it is. She's saying that Russia tipped the scales in favor of Donald Trump by revealing how the DNC tipped the scales in favor of Hillary Clinton. So it was a rigged general election to expose how the primaries were in fact rigged. That makes no sense whatsoever, Jammu. So I mean, if the DNC is exposed as being undemocratic, that's meddling. But moving red states up on the primary map to benefit Hillary Clinton, her lobbying superdelegates and effectively buying them off, that's not meddling. But letting the public know that the DNC was doing all that stuff, that's meddling. Now, to be fair to Jemu here, she did say that she would ban superdelegates. But, you know, I'm starting to realize that when she tries to speak kindly to Bernie Sanders supporters, she's just pandering. There's no substance to what she's saying because she recited the same thing she said last week, almost word for word. Has I to acknowledge, acknowledge the, the wounds, wounds of that the Bernie, Bernie Sanders, Sanders supporters who have. feel, and, and I also, also acknowledge, acknowledge the wounds of Hillary Clinton supporters Clinton who feel that sexism and misogyny no has been too rampant in our party. And in so I don't believe anything that she's saying. And look, Jammu, you said that you wanted to come on the show, you claimed that you would be happy to answer any of my questions, and then you implied that, you know, I was ignoring you, and when I responded, you ignored me. So you clearly don't want to answer any of my questions. So you talk a big game, but you don't walk the walk, and we don't believe you, Jemu. But thankfully, you know, you're probably not going to win. So on this issue of the primary being rigged, I think all the candidates, with the exception of Sam Ronan, get an F because they all failed. Now, moving on, there were other interesting points in the debate. Now, first, Tom Perez was really backed into a corner when he was asked about his support for the TPP. While you were Labor Secretary, you supported and defended TPP. So why would you be the right messenger to bring working class voters back to the Democratic Party? Well, you know, I think implicit in that question is Tom's not a progressive. And you know what? I take a back seat to no one in what I accomplished at the Labor Department. We fought 
for increasing the minimum wage. We implemented an overtime rule. We, we, we attacked the issue of retirement security. I'm proud of the fact that the head of the AFL-CIO called me the uh, you know, best labor secretary since Francis Perkins. So I moved forward. And I was part of Team Obama. And I'm damn proud of being part of Team Obama. And when you're part of a team, you don't go to the buffet line and say, I'm going to play here or play there. Now, if you couldn't tell, he really didn't want to answer the question. Coach Circle strategy, back to the initial question on trade. Can you said, you said, quote, trade agreements like the TPP are critical to our 21st century competitiveness. Now, I mean, Do you stand Dana, by that now? Dana, TPP is dead. It's been dead since you know, uh, last August or September. That was probably one of the most damaging moments to him during the debate, but there were also some moments where Keith Ellison took some damage pretty hard. So he was asked about a previous statement that he said on Bill Maher's show, where he talked about uh, the Second Amendment and gun control. And they claimed that he agreed with the notion that Democrats should come out against the Second Amendment. Uh, and he said that he was taken out of context. So here's what they said during the debate. And he, uh, after that, I'll follow up with the clip of Keith Ellison's appearance on Bill Maher. So you can decide. Bill Maher, then why doesn't your party come out against the Second Amendment? It's the problem. Your response. I sure wish they would. I sure wish they would. No, that was a. If you, I wish you'd play the tape, because if you did, uh, you'd see that it did not go that way. Why doesn't Please. your party come out against the Second Amendment? Bill, I, 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 I sure wish they would. <laughs> I sure wish really you were. because I never yeah. hear anybody in the Democratic Party say that. What no, they you say know. is I am also a strong supporter. You got to check out yeah. the Progressive well, Caucus. We have come out very strong for common sense gun safety rules. Common we sense have, gun safety is bullshit. It's not. What that means? No, it isn't. No, it is. No. It means that there are three thousand types of guns available in the U.S. and you want to ban about two hundred of them. I kind of agree that he was taken out of context because when he said, "I wish they would." Um, the lady next to him was talking, so I don't know if he was responding to her. And then immediately after Bill Maher said that, he began to talk about how moderate gun control is preferable and how it's not stupid and how they shouldn't come out against the Second Amendment. So I'm kind of torn on this. I don't necessarily know. I think it's difficult to determine uh, in the, the appropriate context what he was talking about, but I don't believe that Keith Ellison is against the Second Amendment at all. Uh, however, I think this is still going to hurt him pretty badly. Now, there was also a moment in the debate where both Keith Ellison and Tom Perez looked really shitty because they chose to go to a donor retreat sponsored by David Brock with billionaires instead of attend the Women's March. We were all at the donor summit, the other candidates. And you know what? Oh. The first, I, I know people. This you is not, pointed that out. This is not good. I, I mean, Democrat. I, I wasn't. I mean, this is part of it. You know, this conversation. Um, let's talk no, about Chris, it. Let's, let's, we, I'm yeah. happy to talk about yeah, this. Yeah. Because the first thing I said was, you know, this is a tone-deaf conference. Because I would rather, my first words down there, I'd rather be in Washington. So Tom Perez's response was incredibly embarrassing. Oh, I wish I could be there, believe me. But Keith Ellison didn't do any better. I mean, look, we all go to marches all the time. This idea that, you know, one person went to one march one day and that's some big deal, it's not. The truth is we got to re... Some people got to rebuild the party. Some, some people, people need to march. Lives. All of us need to create a new America where everybody's included. If rebuilding the Democratic Party involves getting cozy with billionaire donors and David Brock, someone who runs multiple super PACs, then you're not going to rebuild the Democratic Party, Keith. You're going to further destroy the party. Now, when it comes to the issue of donors, Tom Perez was really disingenuous, and he tried to muddy the waters when it comes to the issue of banning lobbyists um, from having a say over the affairs of the DNC. I have a friend who couldn't work in the Obama administration for two years because he was a lobbyist with one client, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. I have um, other friends in the union movement who are lobbyists. So are we going to say we're going to take no money from unions? I have other friends who used to be lobbyists, and they deregistered, and now they're public policy specialists, and they're doing lobbying. It quacks like a duck. It acts like a duck. Okay, this is so frustrating to me because when we say we want to ban lobbyist contributions, Perez knows who we're talking about. We're talking about Big Pharma. We're talking about payday lenders that bought off the last DNC chair and made her team up with Republicans to fight for these predatory payday lenders that rip off poor people. So you know what we're talking about. Now, with that being said, there was a lot of negative aspects to the debate, but there were some good moments. And this came when uh, Sam Ronan talked about getting money out of politics. We need to get money out of politics. I mean, quite frankly, the biggest concern I have ran across among people, uh, not just in social media, but I've ran across in person, is they feel their voice is being drowned out by the almighty dollar. 
So how do you fix this? You get rid of money. Now, I was really happy when Sally Boynton Brown reiterated the same exact sentiment. We have to get the money out of politics so that we have elected officials who actually re Thank reflect you. our people. And the party's got to take a stand on that. Thanks. So, I mean, in the end, the debate, you know, even though on most topics, the candidates were good, and I'm kind of giving you the impression that they're all terrible, on some issues that are really important, like the purity test, um, like rigging of the primary, I think that they really didn't meet the mark with the exception of Sam Ronan, who I think performed consistently, although he didn't get enough time. So let me leave you with Sam Ronan's remarks, which I think show why he is the best DNC chair candidate. The issue is we need to bring everyone back together. That's why in Baltimore I talked about the New New Deal, because when we were the party of FDR and we had something to fight for, to build together upon, we were the greatest nation on earth. We had the strongest middle class. We were growing for decades. And then we got into bed with big business. Thank and you. And look at where yeah. we are today. Thank you, Mr. Support this podcast by joining the independent progressive media revolution today at humanistreport.com.